All financial advice provided on this show is for entertainment and educational purposes only. The financial ideas and strategies discussed are only provided as a starting point for a conversation about money matters. With regard to your particular investments and financial strategies, consult your financial planner, CPA, or investment professional. All your financial decisions are yours and yours alone to make and subsequently are solely your responsibility. The information that is supplied through the context of the radio program and any repurposing of its content by the host or network is a combination and collection of solid financial investment understanding, opinion, and comments. This network, show, and its host are not liable for financial strategies, outcomes that you employ in any manner that result in any kind of loss. Shares of corporate sponsors may be the subject of buy or sell recommendations in Jay Taylor's newsletter in accordance with Jay's objective opinion. Welcome to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, speaking to you from the borough of Queens in New York City. It is the 24th day of May 2023. Today, my guests are Eric Coffin of the HRA Advisory. He's a co-founder of the Metals Investor Forum. Gwen Preston, of the, uh, who writes the Maven Letter. They'll be with me in the first segment. The second segment, Michael Hudson of Hand and Metals will join me to talk about the projects they have, a couple of, uh, well, some porphyry uh, copper gold projects in Peru and a sedimentary hosted gold uh, uh, copper silver project um, with some major companies giving him a hand. It's a pretty exciting story. I hope you'll stick around to hear what Michael has to say in the second segment. Um, but I thought it was good to have Eric and Gwen with me today because the Metals Investor Forum is coming up on uh, that's th Friday and Saturday of this week, May 26th and 27th. And we want to catch their views on the markets and maybe if we're lucky, they'll share a couple of their top picks. and. Um, just see what they're thinking and how they're investing, uh, given their views of the markets these days. So thank you both of you for joining me today. Thanks for inviting me, Jay. Yeah, yeah thanks for having us. It's really good. Uh, Gwen, I know you've just been on vacation, so I hope you're uh, <laughs> I hope you're ready for this. Uh, I'm sure you are. You're always ready, it seems. Uh, at least uh, that's my observation. Always good to hear what you have to say. Maybe we'll start out. I want to ask both of you to what your current assessment is of the global economy and, and the financial markets. Maybe we start with you first, Gwen. Sure. I mean, I don't know if I have anything that will be a, particularly new for people out there, except for maybe my take on, on why gold is doing what it's doing, given all the other things. So the things are, you know, that this, this uncertainty, like there was this massive expectation that we had to be going into a recession and the weird thing, Eric and I actually had lunch just about a week ago, and we chatted about this quite a bit. The weird thing is that we're not seeing recession in the data. Like, it's just not showing up. And that's very unusual. We had this histor this rate hike cycle that was historic in scale and speed. Um, and yet we're not seeing a downturn in the hard data. A lot of the soft data, the sentiment stuff, Mm -hmm. still says, oh my gosh, there has to be a recession. It's got to be coming. Let's all start to panic. But the hard data isn't showing it. So that's a very strange environment to any for any investor to know uh, what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Amidst all of it, so when you're in an environment like that, I think there's, it's not surprising to me that base metals aren't having a heyday, right? Base sure. metals do well when there's a pretty solid, expectation that we're going into a growth phase, an economic growth phase, right? And we don't have a solid expectation of that right now. We have a, are we going to muddle through this and get back into growth? Is that what's happening? Or is this recession that we keep talking about actually going to come and hammer us down? Mm -hmm. And that's not a solid foundation for growth. So base metals are just floundering along amidst all of that uncertainty. We can talk about the longer term picture for base metals uh, on which I am very bullish, but in this moment, they're just kind of floundering along. Gold, on the other hand, is doing super well. And there's there's pretty good reasons for that. <clears throat> there's the whole hedge, <clears throat> pardon me, there's the whole hedge of uncertainty thing. I think what really redoubles that is that we've kind of had a, a, a series of Cycles have been tightened up over the last 15 years. And so investors have been reminded several times, more often than some might want, um, in the last 15 years of what gold does in a recession, right? It does well going <coughs> into the recession. <coughs> and then it does incredibly well coming out of the recession. And so because everybody got reminded of that, 
sometimes gold is like meh going in and it doesn't really do that well but oh my goodness does it ever shoot out the other side of the recession mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so because people have been reminded of that i think everybody's there's a lot of well no matter whether, whether we have the recession or not let's get in because if that shoot out the other side thing happens i want to be on board so between the overall just sort of Let's hedge other things with gold, that more specific reasoning and the fact that, OK, well, if we don't get a recession, then we're going to get a metals bull market because of that long term, medium term, even bullish thesis for metals because of all of the metal demand that is out there and the complete lack of su sufficient supply for most major metals. We're going to get a metals bull market. And gold gets to play along with metals bull markets, even though it doesn't have the same fundamentals whatsoever. It usually gets to play along with a metals bull market. So there isn't really, I don't see a good bear case for gold right now on a daily basis. Sure, gold's going to do whatever it's going to do on a daily basis, but big picture wise. And I think that that understanding is just permeating out there. So gold is doing great. Um, it's not shooting to the moon because we don't, nobody's, still knows what direction things are going in general, but gold is doing well. Base metals are just carrying on, trying to hold ground, not getting any attention. Um, on the stock side, we still have a, you have to be sort of the top tier stock to get the attention, mm -hmm. right? Even in the gold space, you have to be the top tier stock to get the attention. Um, and I don't think that will change until we get to a place of a bit more certainty um, because investors are just generally cautious amidst all that's unknown. Um, but that's that's my general take. Once we have some confidence which way we are going, down or up, then I think the scenarios, the the way that one acts in these scenarios will play out. By the way, if you could all hear the beeping, there's construction going on at my house, so I do apologize for for that. <laughs> not, it's not coming through with me, but oh, uh, perfect. So, okay. Well, yeah, it, it, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think uh, your your uh, your view of things. Uh, so one of the things, um, you know, the equity market keeps humming along. Well, not humming along, as you say, Gwen. It's really the top tier stocks that are carrying the major indexes. You make the case it's been a pretty wretched market for most most stocks of all different sectors so it's uh, and as you say the juniors that we all know too well are not doing very well it's the top tier gold stocks as well and i mean in fact that was one of the questions i wanted to ask both you and eric why do you think with gold piercing through to 2000 it's come back a bit now but still as you say very strong why are the gold shares lacking or are not really participating and i guess maybe you've partly answered that um but uh, eric maybe you have some thoughts on that this was this was something else when I talked about at lunch. She, she didn't leave me much, but I'll I'll, I'll deal with this. <laughs> I, I think again, it's uncertainty. If you look at it, doesn't matter what market you look at right now, junior, senior, Wall Street. Yeah, liquidity is incredibly low. I mean, the lowest volume days of the year on Wall Street, I think, were last week. It's just everybody's waiting for the other shoe to drop. They don't know what the hell the shoe is, but yeah. everybody's just kind of sitting back and going, "I think I'll wait and see." You know, I'll wait and see some definite direction that I can buy into, you know, be it short side or long side before I really get into it. And you're definitely seeing that in the juniors. Like there's the liquid, liquidity is terrible lately. And that's made it difficult for anything. But the, as Gwen calls in the tier one stories, they're the only ones that have really attracted much buying. They're the only ones that have really got much reaction when they put out good news. Mm -hmm. Most other stocks either got sold off or they, or they simply ignored the news. When it came along and you know i don't i don't see how that changes unless one of two things happens one is gold goes to some x number and i don't know what it is but let's say 2100 just to mm -hmm. just to pick a round number that's a you know definitive new high mm -hmm. something like that that starts drawing generalists in or or the market as a whole just decides what it wants to do um i don't think sorry about that i don't think uh you know I don't, you know, much like Winston, I don't, I don't see a recession coming in the hard data at all. That doesn't mean the shit won't hit the fan tomorrow. Or there won't be some exogenous event. And of course, if, if there's going to, the most likely exogenous event, if it's going to happen, is probably the debt dealing negotiations. So, I mean, that, that could blow things up. But outside of something like that, U.S. economy is slow, but it hasn't slowed that much. Base metals have been a bit disappointing, but I think that's really got everything to do with China. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when you're talking base metals, China is the 800 pound gorilla uh, and probably will be for a long time to come. And their post COVID boom hasn't really been much of a boom. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just haven't seen the growth acceleration everybody was hoping for, nor have we, at least yet, seen the increase in buying on the base metal side. Yeah. That said, base metal, by and large, base metal inventories haven't climbed as much as they might have in this scenario. Because everybody's got production problems. It's just mine after mine after mine after mine. There's shutdowns or there's breakdowns or there's fires or there's picketers at the gate or they've just got great control issues. I mean, you name it. I mean, it just seems like everything that could go wrong at the big basement of mines this year has. And that's why, although the copper uh, inventories have climbed a bit in London and in Shanghai, they're, they've they done nothing like what was expected. This year was, you know, Gwen and I, and, and I'm sure you all share an extremely bullish view of the media in the long term for most base metals, especially mm-hmm. copper. But this year was supposed to be a reasonably large surplus because there's two large mines oh. that just started up. Okay. So far, we're almost halfway into the year. There's some surplus, but it's it's tiny. It's like mm-hmm. ten or 20,000 tons as opposed to the three or 400,000 that was predicted for the year. So it may simply be that that, you know, barring a recession, it may be that that surplus just does not show up. Because there's just so many various and sunny production problems all over the place. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. In terms, and in terms of gold, I mean, comments pretty much pretty much match Gwen's. I mean, we have seen a really impressive amount of buying out of central banks. I mean, and that that is, you know, that's something that happened far in the past, but it didn't happen for well over a decade. Mm-hmm. And the trend, the buying trend, is quite strong. And it doesn't seem like there's any chance of that disappearing that helps a lot i mean that helps put a put a floor under we're still not seeing a ton of retail buying i don't think there's a lot of hedge fund buying but again some some uncertainty happens that that scares the equity markets and whacks down the bond yields and i think you see that buying show up pretty fast in that circumstance would take a little while probably for liquidity to return to juniors just because if the market's freaking out the market's freaking out so People, you know, people at trade unions are still going to be hesitant and making sure things don't go over a cliff, which I don't think they will. I mean, we're going to have a debt ceiling deal. Let's just, yeah, how much turbulence is there going to be ahead of one? It's not that there won't be one. There's going to be one. It's just, yeah. you know, is there a shutdown or a partial or whatever before? You yeah. know, how far does the game of chicken go? Beats the hell out of me. There will, there will be a debt ceiling for sure. There will be, you know, they'll come to some sort of an agreement. They always do. But uh, there was very interesting analysts that I heard on CNBC the other day suggesting that when that happens is when liquidity is likely to dry up. And her thesis was that what she's saying, the Treasury is not out there borrowing now. They're just drawing down their cash. So yep. when they get the debt ceiling, they're gonna, the Treasury will be back in the market bidding for the savings, the limited savings yep. that are out there. <laughs> so that could be a time... <clears throat> And it seems to me the policy of, of this Fed, at least under Jay Powell, is to con- continue to seeing rates rise and get them back to some sort of equilibrium. I think that's his philosophy. He needs to get back and let the markets determine what the real interest rate needs to be and take it out of the political realm, which is uh, something I'm certainly supportive of. But we'll see. I mean, uh, again, the market hasn't, when you just get past those top tier stocks, the markets haven't done, the equity markets haven't done well. The vast majority of stocks are really sucking wind right now. And so I think, you know, Gwen, you pointed that out. Uh, well, Eric, from what you're saying here about the uh, about copper and maybe some of the other base metals, it looks very bullish long term. And Gwen, we just have to ask you, you're you're starting a new publication. Uh, the name of it is has to do with green energy, right? Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe a little bit about your long term view of some of these energy related metals or let's say yeah uh, green metals absolutely i mean so the letter is called evergreen investing and mm-hmm. we were chatting a bit before we uh, before we hit record on this call about how <clears throat> it doesn't matter what you believe about global warming and anthropogenic impacts and all of those things it actually doesn't matter what what my letter is about is that there is a paradigm shift in how things how the world operates and that paradigm shift is the green shift Mm -hmm. and whenever paradigm shifts happen i mean this one is changing how we move how we eat how we communicate how we like it's changing a huge number how the way how we generate power 
a huge number of the key things that uh, we do industrially and individually in the world. And a paradigm shift of that scale is going to erase old investment opportunities and it is going to create new ones. And mm -hmm. that is underway. Now we're having this major moment of uncertainty and stocks are doing what they're doing and base metals, a, a bunch of which are opportunities within this green moment. They're on pause because <clears throat> moments like this will put a paradigm shift on pause, but it doesn't stop it. This is happening. It's very supported by governments around the world and therefore it is very supported by industry. Um, <clears throat> so uh, along with my colleague, Peter, we started Evergreen Investing, which is about how to position within the inputs and innovations that are driving the green revolution. And I was specific on that. I, I didn't want anything to do with ESG. I don't know what ESG is. It, it had a heyday. It came off a bunch. Guess what? That's because no one knows what it is. Yeah. Things got mixed up in there that didn't really have any worth being in there. I wanted something a lot more tangible and and then also more um, closely related to my expertise. And so this is the inputs and innovations. So the energies, the metals, the um, fertilizers, the carbon credits, the <clears throat> technologies for recycling and things like that. Um, how how can we invest in those? Mm -hmm. And when I say we, I'm, I was, I'm writing this letter for, for everyone. You do not need to be an expert in anything green or metals or energy. I, I want this to be a low risk, how to just position your portfolio, get some things in there that do not carry much risk as long as you want to hold them for a few years. Because right now we're in this pause of uncertainty, but this is a paradigm shift that's playing out. So over the next few years, these theses will play out. How can you just position to benefit as this unfolds? And so um, we've sort of divided up the arenas that we cover, Peter and myself as the two writers. So I cover energy and my main focus there is certainly nuclear um, and then also solar in so much as investing mostly in silver. Um, and then metals, because we could talk endlessly about the supply demand uh, crunch that already exists and that the the green shift is only amplifying mm -hmm. um, and that carbon credits those are sort of my three areas mm -hmm. and um i just really see huge opportunity in all of them now if you talk to probably joe average an investor about carbon credits today you'd be like no one's talking carbon credits are boring they suck no one's talking about them yeah absolutely because it's all on pause but once we get through, once the other shoe drops, as Eric says, whatever that shoe happens to be, and we know which direction we're taking, or I guess maybe better said, once we get back on a, okay, we got through that craziness, and now we're moving forward again, these things will step back into the light because they are needed in the in the structures and mandates that have been laid down around the world. We need more carbon credits. We need way more silver to power um solar photovoltaic cells we need way more nuclear energy and this is i think that's a really good example because nuclear is such a divisive topic um publicly but over the last two years the change in public and political sentiment around nuclear power has just been palpable like it's just very apparent that people are starting to say okay it's what we have to do if we want consistent green baseload power nuclear is the only option and then you know that there is a massive deficit on the on the uranium front that's becoming more and more clear there was a there was a fuel conference about a month ago uh, a whole bunch of the talks and and um from that conference came out and i was able to watch them and people who visited put out notes about what was discussed and i mean everyone to the from the up to the very the most staid conservative uranium analysts, you know, at UXC and at mm -hmm. the uh, the uranium outlook um, analysts, they're just, they just can't, they're like, this has never happened before. We just don't have the uranium that we need um, to feed this nuclear demand that is now so apparent. So I think there's a lot of opportunity out there for anyone who wants to position their portfolio for this, this paradigm shift that, like I say, is on pause right now. Mm -hmm. And that, can certainly look at as an investment opportunity people have people's attention has strayed away from yeah. silver and copper and carbon credits and uranium they just they they're not focused on it right now but i see, see that as an opportunity to sort of get in and put those things tuck those things away in your portfolio so that three years from now you you're grateful that you did 
All right, Evergreen Investing is the name of the letter. How can they sign up? I, I, I received this uh, promotion here this morning in my inbox, Gwen, and I said, wow, this is pretty timely. Uh, we're gonna be talking to Gwen Preston <laughs> in a few minutes from now. And uh, so, I mean, I know how I can sign up, but tell our tell our viewers, how where, yeah. where do they go? Absolutely, it's evergreeninvesting.ca. So that's the, that's the website. If you happen to have my website open as a tab on your browser all the time, which I'm sure many of you do, you can also find it at resourcemaven.ca. Um, but those are the two sites. It has its own website, evergreeninvesting.ca, or at my home site, resourcemaven.ca. All right, Eric, with regard, I mean, this is a general question for both of you. I yeah. got, you know, we know copper, uh, lithium, of course, uh, silver, what, what are some of the other metals that are really uh, that you might be focusing or either of you might think are important in the energy story in the in the green energy story? I mean, copper is the main one I'm following. Yeah. I mean, also nickel. I mean, nickel gets used in a lot of the same things. Um, I give a half thought to aluminum, but the problem it's it's such a oligopoly. I just don't think there's a lot of room for gains on most of the. Yeah, most of the producers because there's only there's like four of them to basically control the whole industry. Right. Um, I'm not as much of a lithium guy, really. Um, I mean, I recognize how incredibly well it's done. Um, I suspect we're probably pretty close to the top, mm -hmm. if, if not past the top when it comes to prices, just because mm -hmm. you know we're not there yet, but we're, we'll we'll see a bunch of supply rolling in over the next little while. Uh, I think I think it'll be easier to grow supply in that market than it will be in say copper or nickel i mean copper you're just dealing with big expensive projects that take a long time to permit mm -hmm. um, the whole copper space has had grade issues with grades average grades mining grades dropped substantially over the last 15 years yeah i'm not sure what turns that around honestly i'm not, I'm not sure anything does nickel's hard just because Nickel's nickel. I mean, good good nickel sulfide deposits are very few and far between. Mm -hmm. um, there is a decent source of nickel in the uh, saprolite stuff in the Philippines, and they seem to be on again, off again about how much they're going to support that production because it's it, it it's pretty it's pretty dirty. I mean, if you're a green if you're a green company that wants to source nickel for your anodes or whatever, I doubt you're going to be buying from those sources because the carbon footprint's pretty horrendous on that stuff. So, yeah. um, you know, you can make an argument. You can make an argument for almost any metal. You can make an argument for zinc too. I mean, zinc. You know, zinc. There's a lot of a lot of uses. It's kind of a secondary metal. You know, a lot of it's going to be galvanizing and stuff like that. But it does it does get used. So, um, rare earths. You know, I've, I've looked at rare earths, and there's a couple of companies that I own, but it's another one of those where. The rare earths are tricky because the, that that sector is essentially controlled by China right now, mm. um, and I have very <laughs> not fond memories of a few decades ago, probably before Gwen was even born, um, <laughs> being being involved because my my dad was a was a director of, of Canada Tungsten, which at the time was the, by far the biggest producer outside of China. Canada Tungsten had a few phenomenal years, uh, essentially because there was an earthquake in China and the epicenter was right in their tungsten mining area. Like it was, it was a bad one. This was before China was really putting out much real news. But um, my understanding is that it, it was in the order of half a million people got killed. It was like an 8.5. It was really, it was bad. Bottom line was their tungsten production basically stopped for about seven or eight years. Canada Tungsten made crazy, crazy, insane money during that period because the price went through the roof. Yeah. And to me, rare earth kind of feels the same way where so much of the production is controlled in China. It's going to be one of those tricky markets where, yes, the world needs it. It might take Western government, like, and say, U.S., you know, say the U.S. Department of Defense says, okay, we want to see rare earth production out of the U.S. or Canada or Australia, mm -hmm. and we're willing to pay X for those rare earth elements, but only if they're produced in those three countries. That may be what helps it, because right now, um, I almost jumped on a couple of rare earth stories, and then the sort of the two main ones, Neobium and dystro Dystropium, they both just got killed in the market. And I think that was straight up China dumping it into the market and just saying, no, 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 we're the market. You guys don't get the startup production. Wow. So I'm a, little, I'm a little leery about that one, even though it's an obvious, it's an obvious area. 
I'm just not, I'm having trouble if the market's just so opaque. Yeah, those are those those markets are really difficult. I, I agree, and the learning curve as well. You know, it's just uh, that's why I've pretty much stayed away and just stayed with the, the base metals and the precious metals. Well, let's just um, sort of finish up here by asking both of you what your maybe you want to name a couple of your top picks and what you might be talking about at the Metals Investor Forum. Who are some of the companies that you're inviting? Eric, we start with you. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll stick to I'll stick to two or three companies that I'm actually inviting that will actually be presenting on Friday and Saturday. First one, is Copper Story Pan Global. Um, I've been a big fan for a long time. They've got a discovery called Ro Roman and the Iberian Pirate Belt. Um, I don't know how big it is, but it's near surface, good grade. More to the point, they just got access to an area called Romana West. It's basically the next, you know, olive orchard basically to the west of where they've been drilling. Uh, the, the owners agreed to give them access. There are old Roman workings that are several hundred meters from where they've been drilling off this resource. Uh, they've been in there. They, they really just got in there a few days ago, but they've, they've already established that, yes, it's the same stratigraphy and VMS deposits are stratigraphic, meaning they're a specific layer, a specific time horizon, because they basically come out of the vent and float down onto the seafloor. So knowing it's specifically the same stratigraphy 600 meters away means odds are, I mean, it's never 100%, but it's pretty damn close that between where they've drilled and those old workings, they're just going to keep hitting more copper. Mm -hmm. And it probably extends for a few meters past that. So now that they have that nailed down, they're doing a bit of quick surface work. They'll have a couple of rigs on it. I expect they're going to be generating good drill holes for several months from there. Plus, they've got another rig or two testing new gravity targets and any one of those targets could generate a boomer and a new discovery. So I just I just think it's a great story. I like that one a lot. And that, what kind of market cap? About 100. Okay. Um, which is, you know, not unreasonable given what they've discovered already and where it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, people kind of, people that don't know the pirate belt kind of freak out when they hear Spain. But the truth of the matter is the pirate belt's actually got a pretty good history and recent recent history and reputation when it comes to permitting. Stuff so does get permitted there. Um, another one that I just, uh, it kind of never, it was never off the list, but it was a Visa Copper was a spin-off from Visa Silver. And I just let it sit on the list because the original projects they had were meh. I, I didn't think that much of them. I knew, I knew that wasn't what they were, they were going to focus on. They they recently added a company called, uh, a company and a property called Woodjam, uh, which is a copper porphyry project in South Central BC. It's already got two or 300 million tons. The great sort of meh, which is kind of standard for BC. BC isn't known except for a few cases for having high uh, copper gold grades. What makes Woodjam more interesting to me is they have established that it is in fact a alkaic or and or calc alkaline type system. Mm. That's the sort of systems that you see up in the golden triangle where you do in fact have high copper gold grades, especially gold. Mm -hmm. um, it's different from that kind of garden variety porphyry that runs through the center of BC that has some of which have size, but the grades are moderate. The other interesting thing these guys have picked up on is wood jam in a couple of areas drilled quite high grade uh, gold copper and it was never clear why that was there or, or whether it actually went anywhere. Um, what they seem to have established, and 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 Craig Perry, who's who's the chairman, uh, it, you know, he's an Aussie. He's got tons of porphyry experience. He's fairly certain what those are is an equivalent to what's called the pencil porphyries in the North Parks camp in Australia, and the, those pencil porphyries, which are quite narrow, they they tend to be quite long kilometer or more. That's really what turned North, North Parks into a, you know, very garden variety, not great porphyry camp into a real money maker mm -hmm. and, a, and a fairly famous porphyry camp. And these things are only, these porphyries these, that are a subset of the broader stuff, they're, they're only like 50 or 100 meters in diameter. They're not big. But because the grades are so much higher than average, mm -hmm. if you can find three or four of them, that, that moves the whole grade curve up for everything. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be testing for new, porphyry but also for new pencil porphyry they're just raising money now uh more to the point craig perry the chairman you know he's told me this he's viewing this as being his job for the next two or three years and this is going to take up most of his time craig is a very very good geologist he's also an even better promoter mm -hmm. he's a 
He has he has a gift for understatement. Let's put it that way. Uh, and and if he's going to really get to work on this, he, you should be paying attention just for that because honestly, Craig's fun to watch. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, the, both those companies will be at the Medals and Mister Forum. Yeah, good. Yeah. All right, Glenn, your turn. Uh, what are a couple of your top picks, and who are you, who are you inviting to the to the MIF this weekend? As it turns out, the MIF this weekend, I only have gold companies coming, so I have to stray away from our uh, our more green metals theme. I can't really pretend that gold is a green metal theme, but that's okay, because um, uh, the companies that are coming are companies that I like a lot, and I'm also bullish on gold, just for different reasons. Um, so uh, I'm going to put out one that is a more advanced opportunity, and that's Heliostar. I know this is one that probably both of you know quite well as well. Heliostar um, has gone through a transformation in the last year. They had a project up in Alaska, which is an interesting, good perspective project for sure. But it's they had some struggles with a bunch of things up there with uh, with seasonality and drilling, and um, it it the market failed to grab it, it failed to grab the market's attention that Unga project. Um, so um, Charles went out and he's like, I we need to do something different. And he went out and did something that was really interesting. He bought a project called Santa Ana, and it has, um, it's it had it's permitted as an open pit mine. This is in Mexico, uh, where Charles has most of his expertise. Mm-hmm. Um, it's permitted as an open pit mine, but with sort of moderate economics, fine economics, but nothing sort of that stands out. But um, Charles and his team, very another set of really good geologists, um, r- really just dug into it and they've identified a panel of mineralization within that that is you know averages five grams per ton can be um can be bulk mined underground so they're re-scoping how this whole project will work um at the same time there's good exploration potential because of the way that previous operators approached it so this project is transforming heliostar i think they've done a very they've done the best job they can of telling that transformation story But there's always going to be a big part of the market that wants to see it. They're not going to believe it until it's happening, Mm -hmm. as opposed to investing when the CEO says this is what's going to happen. They wait until it is happening. We're in that gap right now. So the people who were going to who bought in based on what Charles promised are in and the price has moved up a bit because of that. But I think that there's now a big valuation gap between where it sits right now and where it can end up if they make good on any number of the things that they think that they can do. And none of these things are far reaching by any means. Most of them are basically right at the end of their fingertips. They just have to do a bit more work to show this aspect of metallurgy or to define this aspect of the this pa- panel of high grade gold, right? So they're all pretty close at hand. Um, so I think Heliostar has a very good chance of doing well from here in this gold market because they're really taking a, a, a an asset that was okay and i think they they stand a good chance of turning it into an asset that's really quite phenomenal hmm. and then the other one that i will mention right now is black wolf um so black wolf is working up in uh just on the alaska side uh near stewart bc right the 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 border runs right close there so just on the alaska side um they're working a project up there called hider this is a pretty new acquisition acquisition for black wolf and uh it is an area that was mined sort of back in the 20s when they had to tunnel underneath the glacier to get there, they have some pretty cool pictures actually on their presentation of the tunnel that they had to drive under the ice to do this mining. Now, of course, the ice has receded and this is open, but somehow, even though gold silver exploration is sort of the heart and soul of the Stewart area, somehow this project was basically forgotten. So no one has really worked it since those miners were last there in the 20s and 30s. How big this is, what's actually there, we don't know. It has not been drilled in a modern way. But there are two um, vein sets that are quite obvious on a cliff side that spit out very high-grade samples. It is in exactly the right area because there's multiple projects and mines all right in that area that have exactly the same kind of mineralization with enough scale and consistency to make good economic sense, right? The premier mine is right there. They have they had a section of their mind called the jewel box because it was just like, it's so rich and right. And, and um, so, so there's this mineralization exists right in that area. 
It seems to be outcropping in the cliff. It hasn't been drilled before. They're going to be in there and turning drills. I mean, maybe they are already. It's pretty close to sea level, so they don't have huge problems with waiting for snow to melt. Um, so this is more of a, this is like an exploration punt, right? It If it works, it could work really well. It could also not work because this is exploration, but the odd, the, the evidence looks pretty interesting. The team behind it, um, I mean, Rob's family basically grew up, like Rob is from Stewart, so he's very well connected. He very, he knows how to operate in that area. Um, so yeah, I really like Black Wolf as, a, as an exploration punt in the gold silver arena these days. Very good. And both of those companies will be at the Metals Investor Forum, I guess. Here they will, room. absolutely. Wonderful. Well, I, of course, there's, um, besides the two of you, there's other, I think Joe Masmeter is going to be there, John Kaiser, David Morgan, Chen Lin, my friend. Chen mm -hmm. is going to be there, Peter Karath, uh, Karath your, your colleague there, yeah. Gwen, who's yeah. working with you. Greg McCoach, uh, Robert Sin, and Jordan Roy Byrne. Those are the Busy people day. I saw are scheduled to be there. Thanks. It should be very good. Uh, Eric, uh, any any last word that you might have? No, I mean, I, I mean, I, I actually like I like both of the deals Gwen just mentioned. I follow I follow Hugh uh, Lewis as well. Uh -huh. um, and you know, who knows on Black Wolf? I, I go back a long way with Rob, and I, I also find these veins kind of intriguing. They're they're sticking out of a cliff. When when Gwen says cliff, she means cliff. So at uh -huh. the end of the day, the only, the only real way to test them is stick a drill right on top of the thing. But yeah, I mean, I've always got time for Rob. He's a great guy. Uh, we've got a we got a good set of companies. I know it's been frustrating for yeah. everybody. Yeah. But I just I think things are going to break one way or the other, just because I don't see the current weird market being able to maintain this equilibrium that much longer. Yeah. Um, you know, take your take your pick and flip your coin in terms of whether it breaks up or it breaks down. But I don't think it sits still. And I think in either case, that movement's, you know, either, as you know, as Gwen mentioned, it's either going to be a positive for all metals or it's going to be a, a bigger positive for gold and silver. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that I don't think the time is that far off. So I think the timing is really good this weekend to uh, look at a bunch of great stories. There's 20, 25 companies that are very strong set of exploration and development stories and you know paul also tells a mark like this it boozes frames yeah it's not the light it's... yeah uh gwen one last thought uh yeah i mean i i'm excited to go myself i i always love to go so that i can hear what all of the uh presenters who you just listed what their latest thoughts are and because it's a great group of investors so one of the things when people ask me you know how do i get into metals investing i always say well one of the important things is don't try and do it alone right don't try and figure it all out yourself from the sort of the metals and the macroeconomics all the way down to the details of the companies and the geology. Don't try and do it alone. It's a huge amount of work. Eric and I both do it full time and don't feel like we have enough time to do right. it. So if you're trying to, you know, be a, be a normal person with a job and do this on the side, you will fail if you try and do it alone. But one of the great, one of the reasons that the metals investor forum exists is so that you can meet other investors who also have ideas you guys you know you can find people maybe who you work together with share ideas with and similarly the presenters were also there just to, to talk to trade ideas to learn from each other so i think this is a great moment to do that um a great opportunity so yeah i'm excited right. yeah and i think one thing that needs to be mentioned again is the fact that uh, the speakers aren't going there for pay uh, you're not recommending companies for pay you're recommending companies after you do your own due diligence and, and you know really study these things. Then you tell your subscribers and you share that information to some of us freeloaders as well from time to time. <laughs> Thank you, Eric and Gwen. Uh, really great to have you and uh, all the best in Vancouver. Wish I were there. I won't make it this time, but maybe in the future for sure. All right. Well, well yeah, I try to get out for one, sir. What was even, even if we just fly up and get you to the dinner i mean you, oh yeah that you, would be but, great that would be it great. would be that lovely would be, to see you that would be more yeah. fun than presenting actually just going there you go let's do that I really, okay. I really well, like maybe to we'll do that then i enjoy listening to both of you and, and all the other guys as well so thanks thanks so much again for being with me and uh, sharing your thoughts and ideas with my with my viewers all right folks well don't go away because michael hudson of hand and metals will join me in just a moment
Welcome back to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm happy to have Michael Hudson, the CEO and Chairman of Hannon Metals, with me once again. You know, I've asked Michael uh, to sponsor today's show because, uh, well, I'm a, a pretty big fan of Michael and all he's doing with this company, and especially uh, since they've made some discoveries, some porphyry discoveries in Peru. Um, I was quite excited before about their sedimentary uh, copper silver prospects as well, and I still am. Um, but I guess this is something very special. Uh, it looks like it anyway uh, for Michael. And he'll be talking about that momentarily. Before I say hello to Michael, I should tell you that the stock trades in Toronto under the symbol H-A-N. You can buy it in the U.S. as I have under H-A-N-N-F, H-A-N-N-F. 109 million shares outstanding. Trading today, uh, when I looked at it, around 20 cents in U.S. money. That gives it a market cap of around U.S. $22 million. Thank you for joining me, Michael. Good morning from Australia, Jay. Lovely ah, yes. to be back to you. Yes, it's good morning. It's a, a little after five o'clock here. And what time is it there? It's uh, 7.11 a.m. 7.11. All right. 5.11 here, 7.11 there. 7.11. That's a lucky number, I think. Uh, all right. All right. Well, anyway, um, so you, you have the, you know, the Japanese government's involved in that, with uh, Jogmec. It's a company they've carved out that looks to help. Uh, I guess, to find minerals around the world that the, the, that the country needs for its business, for its uh, industry. Uh, and then you also have uh, Tech, you know, the largest mining company in Canada. Both of those companies are partnering with, one, partnering with you in one way or another. I think Jogmec is a joint venture and Tech is a, an equity partner. Do I have that right? Correct. Yeah, and, and really, you haven't drilled a hole down there yet. And these guys are, are coming after you. Obviously, they see something there, Michael. What is, what is it that uh, you think has them excited and interested in partnering with you there in Peru? It's a, it's it's the key uh, question, I think, Jay. Um, and and it just shows that the world is short of copper. You know, the, you you know all the metrics. We're going to mine uh, more copper, consume more copper over the next twenty years than we have for the history of of of, uh, of the world so uh you know this whole electrification has really put a, a rocket under it and it was already a rocket under it before mm -hmm. the transition narrative really started so so it it shows the big companies are looking for big deposits uh we set out a number of years ago and said where can we make the big discoveries and and we had got to that stage in our career where we could raise money against you know big big ideas i suppose rather than sort of starting at the smaller scale maybe where we went when we were younger and starting from the known around legacy deposits and, and we ended up going into the the uh back arc of peru which is uh you know one of the last untapped frontiers in in a major copper uh a major copper jurisdiction so that that's really i think the simple answer that we're doing something a bit special mm -hmm. well certainly these are the kinds of companies uh especially tech i from my understanding and from my experience are not going to fool around with something small so they see potential for world world-class world scale projects so they're not going to go there but this uh copper porphyry target that you that you've talked about uh, that you're very excited about valiente i think uh what can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's 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 more than one porphyry. It's probably uh, at least seventeen porphyry wow. integrated porphyry scan epithermal systems that uh, exist over one hundred and fifty kilometers. We're one of the larger landholders in Peru. We found a new porphyry district, uh, and and it is uh, Miocene in age. What the hell does that mean? That means it's the right age, basically about fifteen to twenty million years old which are the key was one of the two key producing metal epochs in in the andes mm -hmm. these these porphyries shouldn't have existed out into the back arc which is about 80 kilometers east from the major arc or chain of porphyries and epithermal deposits high up in the andes we're in the high jungle so about a thousand five hundred to a thousand meters altitude but it's uh nice and and uh and jungly out there so uh, it it is um, you know a, a new porphyry belt in the world, and and we've got the first mover advantage, and and that's what tech really came into the company for. You know they did their due diligence, came to site, 
talked to us for a long time just how to get involved. It's something a bit unique, right? We where Peru is is very slow to permit to drill drilling. You know, I'm drilling in various parts of the world at the moment, and it takes weeks to months to get drill permits, but it takes years in Peru, oh. and that's that's the challenge in Peru. And um, and so we're we're really just putting a, 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 a pearl necklace, if you like, or a chain of projects together. Uh, one one area over 15 kilometres, two porphyries and a three kilometre long epithermal and scan systems that form around the edges of these porphyries is, is ready to drill. And we're going through the permitting for that now. And then we're just building up these other porphyry areas. Um, we've done big scale surveys, stream sediments, mag, got 10 geologists on the ground um, and, and really... Um, doing something very unique. So over the next um, six months to to five years, you'll see us drill porphyry after porphyry after porphyry. Well, yeah, you, it lasts over the next five years because it's so massive. But uh, when might the first drill holes go down? Do you, are, is that anytime soon? You talk about it taking so long in Peru. When might we see the first drill holes go down in the Valiente as well as uh, some of the other projects? Yeah, so just uh, just from a just from a higher level, I will answer that uh, directly. We've got the Jogmec Joint Venture, which is a sediment-hosted copper over a hundred kilometres, and that's what Jogmec are fully funding. We should see permits come through soon um, this year on that project. Uh, I'm 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 not giving uh, days nor months because uh, the Peru will always disappoint us. But that everything has been done, um, and and that's ready to go, and it's just in the final stages of of uh, getting the feedback or the, the the tick off from authorities. At Valiente, we've just started a process so we're, we're to permit. So we're probably a year away uh, in Valiente. Um, then we've got two other projects. One we're drilling in Ireland at the moment, uh, which um, at least there's <laughs> there's drill rigs spinning, but not, uh, not, not in Peru. And then we've also got another project in Chile where it takes three to four months. So we're just finishing... Oh geophysics there so so there is drilling action and that's why we brought other projects in to fill the gap essentially because it's very hard to have a public company waiting for permits even though the the opportunity is palpable and, and it's been validated by some of the biggest copper companies in the world so that's uh so dr drilling in ireland today uh chile if uh the geophysics works within the next six months jogmec this year ideally in peru and then valiant any year's time Okay, I guess that's uh, pretty much establishes your priorities then, and uh, you're, you're pretty well funded, I believe, at this stage? Yeah, yeah, we just closed a $1.7 million financing, so we've got over $3 million in the bank. Jogmec fully funds $1.6 million US, so $2 million Canadian. I was just talking Canadian dollars there. Sure. Uh, despite my accent and <laughs> talking to somebody in New York, there's currencies everywhere here, but but uh, the the um, the company's well funded and and funded to drill in Ireland and funded to dr go to drilling in Chile and funded to to get through the permitting in Peru. So now cash cash is not the issue. Yeah. Uh, so in Ireland and Chile, I guess Chile is a, a copper porphyry type of a target. The same thing. And what do you have in Ireland? What's the nature of that? Target. Yeah, Ireland's a bit of a legacy project, um, but a, a, a very good project. So obviously, copper silver in, in Jogmec Joint Venture, copper gold, we've got these alkaline porphyries in Peru, which are a, a little different. They're the gold rich porphyries. So uh, and that that makes that changes the potential economics quite sure. a lot. because and, and the gold companies are going after those copper gold porphyries yes. as well as the yes. copper companies now. And and then uh, in Chile it's just a copper copper project. In Ireland it's lead zinc silver. Okay. So we, we we founded the company. Hannon um, was a guy called Paddy Hannon who found the Golden Mile in Australia. But he came from Ireland and he was in this little village where we set up there in 2016, 17, 18. And and we did millions of dollars worth of exploration, lots of big seismic surveys and. And okay. Ireland has been a top ten producer of lead and zinc for the last forty years, and oh. um, and and we've got one of the best targets there. And we were going to lose ground, or or um, or we kept it by spending some money. So we we kept it at a minimum, and and we're we're testing testing that target. Yeah, and we did at Kilmurray. Well, you're uh, you're doing it right in terms of uh, you know minimizing 
shareholder dilution with your big guys coming in there to spend the bucks uh, to earn in one way or another. And um, oh, you have some really exciting targets, I guess, if they let you drill. But at least you'll have some news coming out of uh, Ireland and Chile, probably. And then hopefully later in the year, if I'm hearing you right, from, um, from Peru, at least from the sedimentary target, right? Correct, correct. And, and, and uh, you, you haven't heard a lot from the JogMec joint venture in the public domain um, over the last year. That, that's really taken a, a back step in the, in, the, in the news flow, but we've got continually got three or four geologists on that project. We're looking at expanding that, that project with more ground. We're, we're picking up more ground and, and, um, and continually working socially, um, breaking into these areas, um, in, into these new areas has taken a, a lot of work to educate stakeholders about what we're doing. And, and, and for the majority of the most part, we're very well accepted by the local people. And that's another key aspect. Uh, you know, how, how can, how can a, 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 a small company break into a new porphyry area or a new sediment hosted area? That's because nobody's looked and nobody's cared to look because those jungle areas were just considered tough. And they were 20 years ago um, with, with, uh, the drug trade down there, but that finished about 20 years ago. Um, from a logistics point of view, it used to be helicopters, but now it's roads everywhere. And and then because nobody had been down there and done the hard work with the communities, it was always deemed too hard. But uh, that that's not the case. People want prosperity and wealth and and responsible development, and and that's what we're we're doing and and working with all those groups. And we work with you know. Um, tens and tens of villages and and uh, we have a, a big social team um, also working down there with us uh, right through to the regional authorities and into Lima. Well, that's essential, isn't it? And I, it seems to me, Michael, that you, uh, first mover is a, a term I associate with you almost because I think the sedimentary copper silver thing, you were one of the first to start exploring that. And that is a very exciting story as well. And so I think you have an awful lot going for you for a $22 million market cap company, Michael. I don't know. You know, I interviewed Gwen uh, Preston and Eric Coffin earlier today um, for this show. And, and Gwen's view is that uh, right now it might be a little difficult for the base metals, but she's extremely bullish longer term because of the things you mentioned, the electrification, you know, the green movement. Um, uh, on the base metals, and Eric is too. I think it's, uh, their, their thinking is that if we're going into a recession, not guaranteed, but if we are, it might be a little bit rough right now, or maybe there won't be a lot of enthusiasm, although they're so beaten down, it's hard to see how they can be more beaten down. Uh, but then, you know, once we come out of the other end, uh, the other side of the recession, there should be, you know, a huge upside for some of these uh, companies. But if you can get some great drill holes, some great drill intercepts, in the meantime, and uh, that could be really exciting, um, provide some real opportunities, Michael. I think so. Uh, so I guess the drivers, we wanna see if we can see some drill results. That's the main thing, right? Exactly, and uh, and that's that's why we've got uh, a few other projects drilling now to, to essentially wait for the slow permitting in Peru, but the opportunity in Hannon is, is palpable. Um, you should, uh, I think of Hannon as, as potentially, you know, a private company, it trades, but you know, you put, yeah. the, you, you put a, you invest in it, and and you put it in your back pocket, and mm -hmm. you wait, and you know, let's see those drill holes. But there's there's multiple billion dollar plus opportunities, oh, billion dollar market cap opportunities hiding in any one of those porphyries, especially, which is what I, I like very much. But equally, you know, the Jogmec JV or Chile um, or Ireland could change our fortunes too. So it's uh, it's it's just one of those things that just takes a little longer than the explosive drill hole in two weeks that the market really likes. <laughs> But it, and 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 I'm doing that in other parts of the world too. But uh, this this one's the big slow uh, sleeper as we wait for those drill permits. Well, maybe we'll have to ask you about some of the ones that aren't so sleepy uh, while we wait for the sleepy one to wake up. So anyway, Michael, thank you so much for your time and and sharing the hand and story with us again. And we'll look forward to some drill results soon. I hope, uh, and I know you hope even more so. But uh, thank you so much for being with us once again.
Thanks a lot, Jay. You'll see draw results pretty soon from uh, Chile, hopefully, and, and Ireland and, and uh, Jogmec this year. Really looking forward to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, folks. Well, that's it for this week. Next week, I expect to have Michael Oliver with me and perhaps uh, a very exciting company as well. Until then, goodbye and God's blessings to you. Bye.